The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dr. Chris Chu and PA Isabel Valdez. Hello, hello. Hello. (laughs) Matt and Paul unfortunately couldn't join us tonight. They're busy putting together other amazing content for our listeners. We miss you guys. We wanted to bring you this quick turnaround episode on COVID vaccines and outpatient COVID treatment with our amazing guest, Dr. Monica Gandhi. Chris, will you remind the audience what we do on this show? Sure. We are The Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls or practice changing knowledge. A reminder that this and most episodes will be available for free CME credit for all health professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Create your account today. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Monica Gandhi. You may remember her from our COVID vaccine episode back in January of 2021. She is a professor of medicine and associate chief in the division of HIV, infectious disease, and global medicine at UCSF. She is now conducting research on mitigation strategies for COVID-19, including COVID-19 vaccines, which we're going to talk about up next. She is going to teach us how to advise patients regarding on the boosters, and she's going to help us understand monoclonal antibodies for both pre- and post-exposure treatment. And just a quick caveat that we are recording this on October 19th, 2021. We know this information evolves rapidly, so check in with trusted sources for updates. So without further ado, let's get to it. Well, Monica, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We're so excited to talk with you again because just so much has changed and there is so much to cover tonight. But we just wanted to first check in and uh, hear what you've been up to in the last... 10 months since we talked with you last. <laughs> um, actually, a lot of thinking about the vaccines. That's what I've really been doing. Nothing else happened in the last 10 months. You guys saw my little Frodo last time, but he passed. So my little dog is not here, but but he's with us in spirit. But yeah, that's why he's not here on the recording. But you've done some whirlwind tours. You've been on ZDog MD. You've been on NPR, I think, and yes. all sorts of places, right? I'm thinking deeply about the vaccines because it's been a fascinating thing to see something roll out like this in real time. Think like everything was going great, then Delta comes, then that sets us back, then Delta goes away, is going away. Like it's been, a have never witnessed anything like this where you're in real time learning so much. It's definitely been a, a new experience for all of us working in healthcare. Yeah, yeah. It's just living on this earth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right now. Yes. What are yeah. you doing right now in terms of wellness? What 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 keeps you um what keeps you well? What do you what do you what are you doing? You know, I um I have two favorite authors. Um maybe we talked about this last time, but it's JD Salinger and F. Scott Fitzgerald. And um instead of rereading their books, which I do again and again, I started reading them out loud to my children. And it's been really interesting. We read The Great Gatsby and they're like, oh, mommy, rich people can be really mean. Um, (laughs) Why did they kill Gatsby? Oh, oops. I hope I didn't ruin it for someone (laughs) who hasn't read the book. Um, So that has been what we've been doing for wellness is reading out loud. That's awesome. So we beat on boats against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past. Exactly. Oh, my God. The last line. (sighs) It really is not actually the most cheerful of last lines, but maybe what we've learned is that we have to learn from the past to inform our future, including vaccines. It's very uh, applicable and poignant given what we're going through today and this this time, this day and age. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. 20 months in. Yes. Hey, Curbsiders. This episode is sponsored by the American College of Physicians. They provide their 161,000 members with lifelong education, clinical support, professional development, and networking opportunities. I love being an ACP member because I'm a huge internal medicine nerd and they have so many great resources for me. I'm a big fan of doing mix-up questions. I use them a lot in my day-to-day practice and teaching. And let's be honest, they're a lot of fun. You know you love them too. 
Plus, the ACP has a lot of other great resources that I'm a huge fan of. If you haven't attended one of their POCUS courses, then you really need to get to the next one in person. It is a fantastic way to really level up your skills in point-of-care ultrasound. So the ACP wants you to be a member today. They have a wide array of free or deeply discounted resources for their members, lots of educational tools, which I've told you about, tons of CME, plus they're always doing advocacy. And right now, U.S. post-training physicians can receive a 20% discount on their first year ACP membership dues. This is a special deal, and it's only available through December 31st. So visit acponline.org forward slash ACP20 and use the code ACP20. That's a 20% membership discount. If you join today, visit acponline.org forward slash ACP20 and use the code ACP20. Well, let's jump into the conversation. Um, we'll start out with a case from Cashlack. Uh, we have Nick. He's a 61-year-old man with a BMI of 30. He has a history of hypertension, and he has received two mRNA COVID vaccines back in February. He's checking in with you about if he should receive a booster. So to start off, there's been just a ton of buzz about COVID boosters. And, you know, I'm getting endless questions on my chart every day about, you know, should I get a booster? Should I get a third shot? When can I get my booster? So where where are we with this? Who Who actually needs boosters at this point? One thing that really impressed me was the Pfizer meeting when they first met about the Pfizer booster. Jonathan Stern from the FDA put together 74 studies in this like beautiful slide that showed 74 studies from around the world and showed the incredible protection of the two-shot vaccine against severe disease and holding up everywhere. And when we really think about the immune system and what comes out with the vaccines, we know that they produce T cells and also B cells, which will produce more antibodies if your antibodies go down, which they do. But those T cells are really protecting us against severe disease. So that was profound information for me in thinking about who needs a booster. Because then I put together, everyone did that information with two other bits of information. One was the CDC breakthrough data. And when you just put in Google CDC breakthrough, they actually take you through who's being hospitalized with a severe breakthrough and who's unfortunately dying with a severe breakthrough in this country. And 85% of those who are dying with a severe breakthrough, and there's only been, there haven't been very many, um, luckily it's about 0.003% of getting a severe breakthrough, um, are those who are over 65. So 85% over 65 get severe breakthroughs to the point that there would be death. And then um, 79% protection uh, against hospitalizations if you're less than 65. And that's regardless of uh, other medical conditions, hypertension or BMI uh, being up like your patient. And then the final piece of data, which I think needs to be advertised more, is New York City just two days ago put out the effectiveness of the vaccines. They're really not waning. It's it's really over 65 again. That's the one group where severe diseases is is that that protective effectiveness is not there. So the way I think of now the boosters is pretty much what the CDC and the FDA decided upon, which was Over 65, immunocompromised, absolutely. And then any other group, I say, talk to your doctor, like the curbsider, like you guys are talking to your patients. And it's not clear that the same risk factors that led to severe COVID are leading to severe breakthrough infections like hypertension, obesity. And I think it's just a decision between patient and doctor. I'm really comfortable just saying over 65 and immunocompromised. Now, there's been a distinction, at least in my institution and other people have been talking about it, between saying third dose and a booster. and But some people sort of use them interchangeably. For you, is there a big difference in how we categorize that and how is that applicable to um, what we talk to with our patients? You know, in the world of vaccinology, the question is, what's your full regimen? And um, many have said, oh, the full regimen is going to be a third dose. But I don't actually think that's true. Um, I think the reason that booster conversations even came up, right? If we were um, Denmark, Italy, Spain, France, a a country that had higher rates of vaccination when Delta hit, especially in different parts of the country, we would not be having this conversation. We would not be having this much viral transmission. If you think about the polio vaccine, it works beautifully unless you have a lot of circulating 
virus around you, and then you can get a breakthrough. And in this country, we had a lot of transmission after the Delta variant, not because it's just Delta, it's because places in the South, many other places, Southeast, many places around the country didn't have those rates of vaccination that they needed to have. And so we saw a lot of circulating virus and you could get breakthroughs. And so the booster conversation really has to do with the fact that we haven't controlled the pandemic yet. And do I think a two-dose vaccine in the best of all possible worlds is enough for mRNA? Yes, I do. And why? Because we've literally like taken biopsies of people's um, lymph nodes and seen really strong B-cell immunity form. We've taken T-cell assays and strong T-cells are formed. It's just that we're susceptible to breakthroughs when you have a lot of virus around. And so I think it's a two-dose vaccine unless you have a lot of virus, which means it's a three-dose vaccine. And then the Johnson & Johnson definitively is a two-dose vaccine. We shouldn't be calling it booster. And we can, we can talk about that. Sure. Okay. So we're talking boosters, two shots, three shots. So, uh, so just to clarify for the audience and for myself, uh, the Pfizer shot, which we were talking off air how to pronounce it is Comirnaty. 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 Thank you. So uh, that is uh, FDA approved for those who are over the age of 16 and over. It's a two shot series. And we've got the booster uh, is for 18 to 64 for the risky patients, the ones where they're immunocompromised. That's the that's the only EUA, right? It's not FDA approved. It, it's just some, a little bit of a nuance there if you can help us understand that. And Yeah, the four categories um, that was approved ended up first the FDA, then the CDC, ACIP, then the CDC director. The four categories are that it's authorized for um, is over 65, immunocompromised, 18 to 64 with medical conditions, quote, discuss it with your doctor. And then um, and then anyone who has a lot of frequent exposure. So if you're a respiratory tech, if you're really surrounded by COVID, you should get a booster because it has to do with that kind of concept that that you're you could have beautiful T cell and B cell responses, but if you're surrounded by virus, you could get a severe breakthrough. And so anyone who has a lot of exposure is recommended for a booster. And I feel like a lot of this has just created this panic among people who are already immunized that they feel like their vaccines don't work anymore. Um, And, and, you know, young, healthy people that have gotten the two shot series and really are well protected. Um, How do we kind of change that dialogue and help them feel more confident? Yeah, you know, I said something really mean on Twitter once, which is after the last two months, as I said, I feel like the messaging in this country has terrified the vaccinated and made the unvaccinated think the vaccines don't work. Because um, we really scared people who are vaccinated that that this wasn't enough and that we would be susceptible to to even severe infection if we didn't get boosters. And also there was the messaging around if you could spread equally if you're vaccinated and unvaccinated, which, which you can't, you spread less if you're vaccinated. So I would say that um, that was unfortunate messaging in this country. And and I was thinking about it today, just today, that we have three major bodies. We have Health and Human Science, uh, Health and Human Services, which is HHS, which is NIH. Then we have the CDC. Then we have the FDA. And these are our three sort of bodies that inform us about what to do and what's best. And their obvious dissent on this issue, and NIH saying everyone should get a booster, and then and then CD and then FDA saying not so fast, and writing four days before the booster conversation with Pfizer and Lancet article where they actually said no one needs a booster. It was it, we had so much dissent, we had so much on the world stage play out um, that I ended up clarifying it for myself and my patients by writing a very simple thing, and this is what I wrote. I said, if you're over 65 and you got the Pfizer within three weeks, like three weeks between, you should get a booster. If you're over 65 and you got the Moderna, I don't actually see, talk to your doctor. I'm not even sure you need a booster. And I'm really going on the data here. And I'll talk about the spacing. And if you are a Johnson & Johnson person, absolutely get a second shot, not a booster. It's called a second shot and get mRNA. And that's how I put it together as simply as I could. Yeah, I think that's interesting how you how the Moderna had that extra week, and I think you talked about this at our at our first uh, at the first podcast that we did back in January about how the longer time between the shots maybe gave us more protection. I guess that's is that maybe what you're using to come to this 
Yes. I mean, now we really have very hard data about increase. We knew it before. It was always a principle of vaccinology. What childhood vaccine is given, you know, three weeks duration. So we've never in our entire planet, given in the history of mankind, have never given a vaccine three weeks apart. That was Pfizer, you know, trying to get the clinical trials done quickly. Totally understandable. But what happened is now we have some very hard data, and it just came out last week, actually, from Canada, who had um, deliberately spaced out uh, the vaccines to give more people the vaccines first, what first dose first. So they weren't doing it for this reason, but they put out exquisite data from the Institute in Quebec, and, and you can show it afterwards to people. But essentially... A uh, three weeks between Pfizer provided 82% protection, and, and and that was healthcare workers. And anyone who got the vaccine seven weeks or longer had 92% protection against severe disease. That's clinical data. Second is there was a cell paper just last week from Canada that showed us that if you extend the dosing interval to six weeks with Pfizer, you get stronger antibody responses and T cell responses. Now, I know there's some mild differences between Moderna and Pfizer in terms of, uh, I, I've heard like the concentration of how much antibody response, like that Moderna was like three times more concentrated than Pfizer. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the Moderna dose is three times as high. So the dose that we give for Pfizer is 30 micrograms of that mRNA that you then make into the spike protein, but Moderna is 100 micrograms, the initial series. So it's three times as much mRNA. So you're producing, I think, three times as much antibodies. And that was a JAMA paper that showed that you got more antibodies. And I think it's, going back to your question, I think it's the four weeks and the higher dose but I think spacing also has something to do with it, given the, the data that we have on spacing from Pfizer from Canada. And do we expect any of these f- future boosters to be at a, at a different concentration then? At the, would, it, would they be full doses or do you think they would be more like a half dose or, or a third dose? I mean, the Moderna booster that the FDA authorized is 50 micrograms, so it's half the dose. Now, to be fair, if you listen to the FDA meeting, they basically said, Moderna's holding up really well, even among older people. And then they said, I know, but we already approved it for Pfizer. We just have to do it now for Moderna. So it was sort of an equity like thing. I mean, if, actually, if you spent time listening to the meetings, they were fascinating because on Friday, I think they were tired and the FDA advisory committee just said, we had to confront these questions of boosters in a way that this is not comfortable, that politicians message something before we get to go through the science. And they were, I think, disappointed on how this rolled out for the American public. And that's why I try to like boil it down and just make it super simple. Um, and so I'm not sure, you know, the Moderna data is very fascinating because there was a CDC study on September 24th that compared the three vaccines. Um, it was Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson, Johnson. protection against all hospitalizations across 18 states with the Moderna vaccine, 88% with Pfizer, 71% with Johnson & Johnson. So that really tells you how good Moderna is holding up two doses, and that was across age ranges. So, I mean, I will just explain that I have an 87 and an 80-year-old father and mother who both got Moderna, and they have not gotten a booster because I'm really comfortable with what's going on with them right now. And the FDA advisory committee, that they did vote unanimously to approve. That's correct? They did. But again, listen to their discussion. They said, okay, we do this for Pfizer. So we're just going to give it the same groups with Pfizer. And then what really, and I think they were right to do it for Pfizer because again, it was, I think is the spacing, but, and, and I think an 18 to 64 year old with medical conditions, like your patient who's has BMI up and hypertension, who got that three week spacing, I would really consider a dose for them. I would consider for a health worker who got Pfizer versus Moderna, a dose for them. So I think it's really, we have to remember these subtleties, but they literally said in the meeting, well, we did it before, so we have to do it for this. But Johnson & Johnson was even more interesting, which is that this never should have been a one dose vaccine. And then they really went wild and said, this is two dose which I agree with. Um, If we were to pivot a little and say that our patient got his vaccination in, say, somewhere international, maybe like the UK, and now he's here and he's having this question about, uh, I had AstraZeneca in the UK, I'm here now, same BMI, same hypertension issue, and he wants to get a third boost, or in this case, I guess, a booster. Uh, How should we counsel him? Because it's happening a little bit, you know, the, the occasional patient will come in with, we got a we got a vaccine outside of this country. How should we 
How should we try? How should we counsel them? Because they there are asking specifically a, a lot of them like, can I get the Moderna? Cause I heard it did better. So there's always that little chatter that comes up in clinic. So how can we counsel them? You know, I think anyone who got the AstraZeneca should get a third dose, which is mRNA. So one thing to remember is AstraZeneca, Sputnik V, and Johnson & Johnson are all the same type. They're like the adenovirus and then inside is the DNA. And they don't have the same level of protection. There was just an article today in Lancet Regional Health from Sweden that showed that people who got two doses of AstraZeneca were not near enough protected as compared to getting one dose of AstraZeneca and one dose of an mRNA. And the important thing about that study is it wasn't like antibodies or T-cells. It was real world clinical information that we really want as clinicians. What was your rate of getting infected with the Delta variant in Sweden with 110,000 people who got an AstraZeneca plus an mRNA or who got two doses of AstraZeneca? And your protection was at least 30% higher, went from 50% up to 79% if you got a AstraZeneca plus an mRNA vaccine. So anyone who's coming from any country that has just AstraZeneca, just Sputnik V, or just got one dose Johnson Johnson, I'm telling them to get an mRNA vaccine for sure. But they don't need to do the full series, just a single dose? It's just the single because it actually was just to comparing AstraZeneca plus one dose of mRNA mm-hmm. and your level of protection was so high. There's something about that combination of a DNA and then an mRNA. And I think it has to do with they're kind of different. They code for different parts of the spike protein. So you almost have a more diverse immune response if you get both. But it's something about priming with a DNA and then getting your second as an mRNA that works better than the opposite. I don't know why. So I have uh, I have cousins who live in Canada, um, and uh, when they when they got their doses, um, some of them actually got mixed MRA. You know, they got one was Pfizer, second was Moderna, just because of availability, especially at the beginning of pandemic. That has me thinking about in terms of boosters. Is there any evidence about looking at um, mixing um, the mRNA? Like, so if I finish my initial series with Pfizer switching over to Moderna for my booster. Is there, is there any evidence for that? Is that, would that be a bad thing to do? There's sort of evidence for that, which is this NIH mix and match study that was just a week ago, like last Wednesday. And they did the nine different combinations. And those nine different combinations were like, think about all three vaccines and then boost with uh, that third vaccine. And so basically like two doses of Pfizer and then give a Moderna or two doses of Moderna and give a Pfizer or one dose of Johnson & Johnson and give a Moderna or Pfizer. And basically what they found is that they are all fine. Like it doesn't matter what you boost with. Um, your antibodies went up with the third shot because that's what boosters do. They will make your antibodies go up. They may not make your fundamental T cells or B cells get any better than they already are, but they all made your antibodies go up and there was no issue with adverse effects or any problem. The safety was the same. So wherever you are and whatever pharmacy has, just take that. And I actually think that's a good thing in terms of accessibility. Maybe something is the pharmacy's out of this and now we can use this. And I, when you think about like how we give hepatitis B, I never know the brand of the hepatitis B vaccine. It's just whatever your hospital bought. We only know these brand names because we're in the middle of like a COVID pandemic. But I, so it did, they, there was no issues with, with mixing. And the, the antibody testing, is that just really for research at this point? Is there a clinical role for it? You know, sometimes my patients want an antibody test to show that they've already had COVID, and then maybe they don't need a vaccine or want to know if their vaccine worked. Is there value in that? You know, I mean, the party line on what you just said is no, there should be no antibody testing because like, what if someone has a 2,500 and someone has a 1,000, but their 1,000 are higher quality than the 2,500 because you have a more in-breath response after the second dose? Um, and what's also the protective level? The one thing I will say about that is I think it's useful in immunocompromised patients because it is a marker soon after the second dose that they may not have the T cells to help the B cells to make the antibodies. So that would be one place where I think it could be useful. 
But antibodies will always come down with time. And that's why it's like, it's so normal. Like our, I don't have any antibodies from my, I didn't get chicken pox. I got chicken pox as a child. I didn't get, so I never got a vaccine, but I don't have antibodies for my chicken pox as I got as a child because it's totally normal. It goes down with time, but I have T cells and B cells and I'll be able to make antibodies in the future. So the problem is people weigh in at different points and it may confuse them. So I was talking to one of our, um, our, our clinic managers who's in charge of um, some of our vaccination uh, management and supply chain. And, uh, you know, now I think the U.S. is seeing average more boosters being given per day than um, people first doses. I think that we crossed that threshold sometime last week. Um, we did hear a little bit that possibly Pfizer may be dialing back their production of the adult size in anticipation that they're going to have to be producing a uh, smaller production size of the pediatric um, vials. Um, have you heard anything about that? Yes. I mean, they what the White House told us is that these these smaller vials are going to be ready to hit hit us like in November. So I'm really hopeful that they will be widely available. I will say that I've also heard the White House said they should be given out, and this would make sense to you, in, pedi- in pediatrician offices, right? Because I think that conversation is so important between parent and pediatrician. Awesome. Any last um, things about vaccines before we move on to treatment, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure treatment? I mean, the one thing I would say about vaccines, just the final thing, is that, you know, the CDC put out data just a couple of days ago that unvaccinated people are 11 times more likely to die in this country during the Delta surge than vaccinated. And there was data from L.A., that vaccinated people, uh, unvaccinated people are 29.2 times more likely to be hospitalized. It, I definitely understand that people feel like there's complex reasons why people aren't taking the vaccine, but this is as life-saving as it gets to me, um, you know, and this data is so clear. So um, I hope that we can get more vaccine uptake in, in regions that are still quite questioning it. I think it was sad that the boosters were given out more than first doses to people because, you know, just even having a first dose is so protective. Yeah. As I've been talking to my my patients, you know, I I describe COVID now as a disease of the unvaccinated, which at least for now, you know, some of them we can't vaccinate. So I'm I'm really, really hopeful about um, these upcoming uh, uh, discussions with with some of our pediatrics. So yeah, preventable now. Yeah. Yes. Thankfully. Hey, Curbsiders. We're sponsored today by Provider Solutions and Development. Are you thinking of a career change? Do you not really know where to start? Well, Provider Solutions and Development, they're going to give you the tips you need to find the place where you're meant to be. They're going to help you do some deep thinking into like, who am I? What kind of job am I looking for? Am I an introvert, an extrovert? Do I want a large hospital system? Or do I want something smaller with a family feel? They're going to ask you these questions, and they're going to work with you to find a place that is meant for you. They have over 20 years' experience and exclusive access to hundreds of positions nationwide. They knew that recruitment had to change, and that's why they took away quotas and started listening to you, the clinicians. They are experts that are going to focus on finding out who you are so they know where you're meant to be to find you the perfect role for your next job. So start the conversation today or reach out to one of their career navigators at info.psdconnect.org forward slash curbsiders. That's info.psdconnect.org forward slash curbsiders. Uh, Isabel, do you want to move us on to the next case? Sure. So in our next case, we have James, who is a 44-year-old man with a renal transplant on immunosuppression who has received three doses of his mRNA vaccine. He unfortunately developed a mild cough, some myalgia about three days ago, and his COVID test came back positive today. So he's currently stable without significant dyspnea, and he can take care of himself at home. He has blood pressure cough, and he has his pulse, ox, uh, pulse oximeter at home, and his vitals are normal. So um, what are the next steps in care for James that we can that we can do for him at this point? So, you know, we do have the availability at this point and actually um, approval, not approval, but authorization from the FDA to um, give someone like 
James, who just de- is immunosuppressed and just developed um, mild COVID to give him monoclonal antibodies. And the reason to do this in someone like um, James is that he is immunosuppressed and he, you know, we definitely say get a third shot and he already got a third shot. But um, there was actually this study that showed that um, it's harder for those really nice B cells to form in the lymph nodes if you have an immunosuppressive condition, like being on renal transplant medications. So he would qualify for monoclonal antibodies. And this is like a great thing because they are so effective in keeping people out of the hospital. Like he's the perfect person because they're really not for people who are in the hospital. Um, At that point, your immune system is kind of taken over and uh, your immune system makes it so hard um, that we have to give steroid. I mean, that's really the mainstay of of therapy in in the hospitals, dexamethasone, because, you know, it's really a problem of, of massive inflammation. But he is the perfect person as he's trying to mount his own antibiotics bodies to the booster and to the infection to give him the ability to have um, antibodies that are infused into him. And it can be either injectable by IV and infusion for an hour, or it can be four shots. But I know it sounds like four shots, but it's subcutaneous injection. So it's really kind of easy. But there is a one issue, which is that you do have to monitor people for an hour after they get it. Um, so just, just to make sure there's no allergic reaction or anything, because it is an antibody. And then you send them on your way and they are, they often do great. So I would give, I would call him that kind of person. And then I will think about another antiviral that's coming later. And for him also, it's about timing, right? Because if he had his symptoms, his st- symptoms developed in the last 48, 72 hours, tested positive, we can do it. What, what if his symptoms had started 10 days, 11 days ago? Like we're getting into a bit of a, a gray zone there as far as when we can give him the, the monoclonal treatment. Right. So what happens is the viral load of the virus goes up and then it comes down within five days. And so what we really want to do is get them at least within, the sooner the better after they've been tested and they're positive, because it's really trying to influence as the virus is active, the virus comes down really quickly. And then it's really your your own immune response that takes over in terms of getting to severe disease if he gets there. So, um, so this infusion really needs to happen quickly and before they're hypoxemic. So you just said he he didn't have hypoxia, which is great. Um, And uh, they really can't show symptoms of um, what would require hospitalization because it really, at that point, it's too too late and it's too long. So we want it as early as possible. Who else would qualify for monoclonal antibody? So obviously this patient who is immunosuppressed, but what about my 40-year-old male who just has a little hypertension and elevated BMI? Or my 18-year-old who's otherwise healthy, like who are the who are the prime candidates for a monoclonal antibody? So you know, right now there's just by definition because it's hard to make and it's expensive. We just have a shortage, and so what that shortage means is we have had to decide and prioritize um, who would be uh, who who would need it. And what our first priority is actually unvaccinated people because they don't have that ability to mount an immune response from their adaptive immunity because they haven't gotten the vaccine. So we are actually um, prioritizing unvaccinated people who have declined the vaccine who are at risk. And then in terms of patients who have it, who've gotten the vaccine, we're prioritizing next immunosuppressed individuals like your patient. And then the third criteria would be if they were at risk for severe COVID, like you mentioned some kind of mild risk factors. But if you had multiple comorbidities that would predispose you to severe COVID. And then the fourth, and this is like, we can't even get there because we just don't have the supply would be post-exposure prophylaxis for someone who's in a household, they're immunosuppressed, someone got COVID in the household, we just want to make sure they don't get COVID. So this is even before they diagnose as positive. But there is there is the real world limitation that we're having of shortages. I mean, it's really expensive. The government bought the doses, uh, and it really isn't about the doses itself. It's about kind of also the logistical stuff that it takes to have a nurse and an MD and watch them for an hour. I mean, it's not easy to have all that happen. You want an outpatient antiviral. 
I mean, it's on the EUA. It's 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 a patient population you should try. But it, yeah, we're being hemmed in by logistics and availability. And yeah, um, I it, mean, there it, is one more AstraZeneca dual monoclonal antibody that's coming that got just presented a couple of weeks ago, and that may be easier. So, you know, any any more supply would be good to have these. And is there any difference between the different options, or are they basically the same? And just whatever's available, you should go with. You know, their differences are really the biggest in terms of administration. I do think the sub Q f- in four p- different places is the easiest way to give it because you don't have to put in an IV. And on the other hand, kids don't like that, but it's not actually approved for anyone less than 40 kilograms. So you can't have it for kids. I mean, that's your issue with the five to 11 year olds. They don't really fit in these category for monoclonals. They're studying it, but they don't have it. Um, so but in general, they're all kind of the same. They're good. I mean, they, it, it's, they're all the same mechanism. In general, you want to kind of try to give two because they can become very resistant to one and there are different parts of the spike protein that they bind to. So they're manufactured in a lab. They're, you know, from like how you make up monoclonal antibodies. So they're not, but they can be allergenic. And uh, yeah, we're just hemmed in by, by availability. I, I will say that a lot of our supply went to unvaccinated, um, you know, people who had declined the vaccine during the Delta surge because we had such high rates of people who got sick. Now, unfortunately, I do have patients who are still unvaccinated and also are experiencing their second episode of COVID uh, reinfection, should we one try to avoid the same monoclonal antibody that you had given before if they're, if, if they were given treatment the first time around? Um, that's a very good question. There is resistance if you give just one monoclonal antibody, but if you give two, just like you give two antibiotics or two HIV drugs, you should not have to avoid, avoid the ones that are given in infusions of two different ones. So don't give a single antibody to someone who's in reinfection. Right. So say they had the gamalivimab, estivimab the first time. Eddie, and yeah, then six months say Eddie. and then six yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then six and then six months later they got reinfected. Um, should I try to go with one of the other one of the other manufacturers or is it okay yes. to, if I only Okay. Because at least again like this all theoretical, but when they were given without being combination, you may have developed resistance to one. So they're really just kind of different places in the in the spike protein. So I would try another one. And I'm sorry to hear about reinfection. And you mentioned the allergy side effects. Are there any other side effects that we should be aware of? There has been hypotension during um, infusions that are just not from anaphylaxis, but just low blood pressure. Um, and so it is, it really does requiring, someone has to be an RN or above um, to be there monitoring. And then an MD absolutely has to be available, you know, run down. And then frankly, they, it has to be given in a place where if needed, there's an ER nearby. So that definitely does limit the availability and opportunity for those. Yeah. Like if example, it couldn't be done at home. Yeah. Shouldn't be done at home. But gives us a nice segue into Molnupiravir, which uh, I'm I love that they named it after Thor's hammer. I think that's, yeah, that's wonderful. I, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I hope they don't give it an awful brand name um, that we can't pronounce, <laughs> like Komernati. But, like um, Molnir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope they just call it the hammer. <laughs> I'm very excited about molnupiravir, actually. Maybe it's because I'm an HIV doctor and it's an antiviral, right? Like monoclonal antibodies are one thing. Like that's like giving hepatitis B immunoglobulin if you haven't mounted a response to the hepatitis B vaccine. But here is like something really specific where you're directed against the polymerase of the SARS-CoV-2, RNA polymerase. And it's not just against SARS-CoV-2. It was actually tried to be developed even before against RNA viruses like RSV. But now we have good data. We already had phase two data that it was bringing down the viral load if you give it within five days. But now we have phase three data from some study called Move Out, which shows us that out of 775 participants, that it reduced the rate of being hospitalized if you had mild to moderate COVID and you got it 800 milligrams POBID by half. Um, and it there were eight deaths in the placebo group and zero deaths in the molnupiravir group. And they had to stop the trial early because it looked so good. And they have already, Merck has already applied for the EUA from the FDA. So outpatient, five-day treatment, BID, pills, can go home with it. It kind of sounds like Tamiflu, but it's even more effective. 
And the window for that will probably be similar to the monoclonals? Within less than five days. Yeah, really, okay. because it really is when your virus is actively replicating. Otherwise, it's no help. There was a study called Move In where it was given in the inpatient setting, no effectiveness, because by that time, your virus has stopped replicating and you're sick and then you need other things. Can you talk a little bit of between the difference between this antiviral and, say, something like remdesivir, which I know had a recent study which showed it actually worked better in the ICU setting, which is outside that window with, with active viral replication. Do you know anything about that? And can yeah, talk about that? I, yeah, I don't. That's a very good question. They have um, sliced the data a lot for remdesivir. And you're right, it seems to work in the sickest patients. Um, I can't say I understand that. I don't understand it. Um, it could be a molnupiravir is orally bioavailable. And so it simply didn't work in hospitalized patients who have other things going on. I really, I can't say that I know. And remdesivir is IV infusion. So I was surprised by that data. So I don't know. I kind of wanted to ask, maybe like merging this conversation with the one we just had about vaccines, because some of my patients, they were infected, they got monoclonal antibodies, um, and uh, and now they're interested in getting the vaccine. These are unvaccinated patients that got the monoclonal antibodies. So the timing, there's some timing that has to pass between when they get their monoclonal antibodies and their vaccination, be it their first dose or their third dose. I'm curious what your thoughts are on timing and also I guess it might, we, might, we might not actually know uh, about the timing between molnupiravir and vaccination. Should it have, should it be somebody something that we give to an unvaccinated patient? So, can you comment on that? Uh, maybe the, form, yeah, the first part of the question. I mean, I think the monoclonal antibody they say ninety days to get the vaccine. I find that very long, and that doesn't make sense to me. Because one thing that people will ask, and there were people who said, well, I'm not going to get the vaccine, but I'm going to get monoclonal antibodies. But, you know, monoclonal antibodies are so much, I mean, they're actually still under emergency authorization and the vaccine is fully approved, at least the Pfizer one since August 23rd. So that wasn't clear, like that line of reasoning, but mon but monoclonal antibodies in no way stimulate your immune system. Like they don't make your immune system make antibodies like a spike protein would. That's really a spike protein is foreign and then your immune response forms antibodies and B cells and T cells to that spike protein. So monoclonal antibodies should wash out of your system really soon, like within two weeks. So I don't really, I have to say, I'm not sure why that 90 days is said. And I mean, I would give the vaccine after at least like two weeks or four weeks after getting your monoclonal antibodies. And it's great that people want the vaccine after that to prevent and then molnupiravir, no issues, like, like the vaccine could be given the next day because, or that day, because it really has nothing to do with the immune system. Um, and um, it's really just targeting the SARS-CoV-2 polymerase. The only thing about giving a vaccine when you have COVID is, at least in, in the younger patients, there was um, signs that you could have more side effects if you give a vaccine in the setting of COVID. And then never give a, I would never give a vaccine to someone who had just had dexamethasone either, because what's the point? You don't want steroids to mess it up. So I know people sometimes give it in the hospital, but to me, that doesn't make sense because you just kind of messed up your timing if you've just on steroids. And maybe that's a good lead in as to other treatments that we should be aware of uh, or should not be using in the outpatient setting. I My understanding is there's no role for dexamethasone in the outpatient setting. Is that correct? Right. There's nothing except monoclonal antibodies in the outpatient setting. I mean, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. So no ivermectin. Yeah, yeah, no ivermectin. <laughs> None of these work. I mean, they just don't. And, and molnupiravir is the first orally available agent that works. And I personally think that if you combine the 5 to 11-year-old vaccine and you get molnupiravir, we are getting to a point where COVID is extremely manageable because you have everything you need almost. And I don't think a five-day course is going to make anything resistant, even though you, if you gave like single therapy for longer, it'd probably be the virus would become resistant. And then second is it's not mutagenic if it's just five days. I know people have been concerned about that. With We do say like ribavirin, don't get pregnant, like maybe immediately. Like what they say, just wait for four days after molnupiravir before you attempt pregnancy conception. Um, and then the third thing is that it really doesn't have that many side effects for five days. So I just, you could see this future where even molnupiravir is given to vaccinated breakthroughs if they had mild to moderate. It wasn't studied that way, but why not? You could see it. And so I think it's, I think it is a game changer. 
I know. I just want to say one more thing. There are protease inhibitors coming. So you know how like this is a nucleoside analog. They're studying um, protease. They're very early phase development, but there's going to be some other, I hope, antivirals that are available for COVID because I don't think we're going to ever get rid of it. So say I have a patient who was recently diagnosed with cancer, is on chemotherapy, maybe some steroids too, and then contracts COVID-19. Do you see a, a, a place where we do give monoclonal antibodies right away and then do a chaser with monoparavir or, or that sort of combination? You know, the thing about monoparavir is it will, it's a great question. Like, could it be a pre-exposure prophylaxis agent in some way or a post-exposure prophylaxis agent? I'm not sure about PrEP because you never know if you're going to go into some place where you'll see COVID, but I could see a role in post-exposure prophylaxis. It's not been studied this way, but if someone in your household has it and then you trans and then it transmits to you just like prep for hiv works even before you develop disease it's just stopping that virus from getting entry i could see that there would be there's a mechanistic reason to think that would be helpful so now the ne- the only way for that to get expanded use though is for that that study to be done but you you couldn't see someone getting both therapies for an active infected infection I mean, there would certainly be no issues getting both therapies because they're so totally different. So maybe, I mean, actually, again, one's like directly acting on the virus and one's giving you stuff that you need to form, which are antibodies to protect you against the virus. So there would be no, I could see no conflicts in getting both, like no issues in getting both. Yes, I could see that in the future. I mean, this is the great thing about having not only molnupiravir, but monoclonal antibodies, and then eventually protease inhibitors, which I hope will come out. You can see this like way to protect ourselves going into the future, even uh, if we can't get rid of COVID completely, which I don't see any way to do that with a respiratory virus that looks like so many other respiratory viruses. That is really exciting. Yeah. Especially for, for people who don't have a great response to the vaccines. Yeah. And yeah, just to feel like that we have some more options and Yes, it's it's we amazing how treatment. Well, yeah. yeah, how far we have come in the last ten months. Because when yeah. we talked last time, it was really just the vaccines were brand new. We were super excited about those, but things are are moving forward. Yeah, we and 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 it's I think of it like pertussis. Like pertussis has a treatment which is macrolides, and it has a really good vaccine. But not everyone takes the vaccine. And then like before children can get the vaccine, even when they're really tiny, they could get pertussis. So like there is a role for treatment. And I could see this. I mean, I think once you have treatment and prevention, you really can control a new pathogen. I think that. That high note is probably the best way to end the episode, don't you guys think? Yeah. Yes. (laughs) I think that I think you might like your take home points are all there, but do you have any other take home points? I think that if you feel more comfortable getting a booster, I would say get a booster if you'd like, but I'm only really recommending it for my patient 65 and immunocompromised and Johnson Johnson. And that's one main take home point. Get monoclonal antibodies if you can, if you're unvaccinated um, and sick, or if you're immunosuppressed and um, exposed, or you get it. And then third, wait for it, five to 11-year-old vaccines three, two weeks from now, and also molnupiravir in four weeks, three weeks. And I think, I really think we're going to get through it after that. Awesome. (laughs) Fantastic. Anything else that you want to plug? I don't. I mean, one thing is that today, you know, the AA American Academy of Pediatrics declared a mental health emergency in kids. And I just would really like to plug that um, if I could, and this is outside the scope of this talk, but um, test to stay is a strategy um, that has been used in multiple countries around the world. Some states are using it. This is the idea that you try to shorten quarantine if someone's had an exposure by allowing them to test with a rapid antigen and staying in school. And I just think we need to minimize school outages during this time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. That's a lot of high notes to end on. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get your weekly show notes in our inbox. We are committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us as thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A very special thanks to our social media team, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Twitter, Maddie Mad Dog Morgan on Instagram, 
Tim Akarnikov on our website, MG Allen and Jeff Carter on the transcription team, and our co-host, Chris the Chu Manchu on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Isabel Valdez. A reminder that this and most episodes are available free CME credit for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuahealth.org. Create your account today. Until next time, I've been Chris the Chu Manchu. And thanks to Stuart for composing our theme music and to Claire Morgan of Notterly for editing our audio. As always, this has been Dr. Molly Hoiblein. Thank you and good night. <laughs>